I'm going to be joined now, um, uh, a continuation um, of our call of conversation last week. The conversation last week we discussed, uh, we were beginning to discuss a progressive foreign policy with one of the writers for the Progressive Army. Um, he wrote an article entitled Towards a Progressive Foreign Policy, um, written by Kirk Hackbarth, and we're being joined by him now. Um, so we can continue the conversation. We got disconnected last week. Uh, Kurt, first of all, thanks again so much for coming back to join us. How are you today? Great. Thanks. Thanks for having me back on. My pleasure. My pleasure. So last week we talked about um, um, your Mexico and the Great Great Wall. Uh, and I think right. today actually or yesterday you published a piece um, talking about the Democrats and the art of failure. Uh, but I want to pick up right where we left off last week discussing um, the progressive foreign policy piece towards a progressive foreign policy. You have five principles in that article that you feel like represent the what would constitute yeah. a progressive foreign policy foreign policy. Run those down for me. Sure. So <clears throat> the five uh, points are the first one is uh, a real biggie, which is uh, self-determination. And this is an idea that goes all the way back to Woodrow Wilson, um, the League of Nations at the end of the First World War. The idea is that countries have the right to determine their own destinies. Mm -hmm. This is a fundamental principle that we've systematically violated. Uh, throughout the 20th and the beginning of the 21st centuries, and we've seen examples that could go on for, you know, we could have a really long discussion about that. So I think a, <clears throat> the first underpinning of a progressive foreign policy uh, is respecting countries' rights to their own self-determination. That's the first very important point. Uh, the second point was um, kind of a little bit biblical there, turning guns into uh, plowshares. Mm -hmm. When I was a kid at the end of the Cold War, we talked a lot about this idea that there was going to be a peace dividend. We'd had uh, 40 years of a, of a Cold War, and then finally we were going to be able to turn all those military resources into civilian purposes, rebuilding our infrastructure, roads and bridges, and improving education, healthcare, the arts, so many things. Mm -hmm. And that never happened. That never happened. You know, they, they trimmed the toenails of the military industrial <laughs> complex, but yeah. the military, you know, the military machine just kept churning right on. They just kept founding more conflicts and more wars to get into. Okay. You know, we have um, a $600 billion a year uh, military budget plus war supplementals and security agencies that dwarfs what we spend on things like education on health you know people go after food stamps food stamps are a drop in the bucket right compared to this gigantic military budget so that's another big point <clears throat> uh, the third point is ending uh, the international <clears throat> ending our participation in the arms trade uh, half of um, all of arms sales in the world last year came from the United States 40 billion dollars um, the Obama administration was big into arms uh, into yep. arms sales both Democratic and Republican administrations have been it's across the board uh, Obama, over his, over his term, sold over $100 billion worth of arms to Saudi Arabia, you know, our big buddy in, uh, in the Middle East. And Saudi Arabia is a fundamentalist, women-suppressing regime that then turns around and uses the weaponry we sell them in conflicts like Yemen, which have been devastating, and others. So, you know, we've got to really, um, we've got to really look at uh, the, the idea that we shouldn't be arming uh, the world to the teeth and then expect that there not be a blowback because mm -hmm. of that. That's okay. the third point. <clears throat> uh, the fourth point is putting human rights above uh, corporate privileges. And uh, I used as a case study the example of, of Mexico. Uh, the United States has been, you know, gung-ho and, and uh, all about supporting the, re the government of Enrique Peña Nieto in, uh, in Mexico, which has, had, which has a horrible human rights record. Um, you know, the disappearance of the 43 uh, students in Ayotzinapa a few years ago made headlines around the world. Uh, Mexico's got uh, a terrible uh, record um, uh, with regards to the assassination of journalists, among the worst in the world, beyond, behind Iraq. But you don't hear about that because, you know, Peña Nieto is the United States' big buddy. Mm -hmm. They just privatized Mexico's oil, uh, state-run oil system. The United States really wants to get in there. So it's the same old story of, you know, economic interests uh, outweighing uh, human rights. You know, and human rights is not just, you know, uh, fancy, you know, uh, shouldn't be just uh, fancy dialogue. It's really something that you have to put into play um, in a very real sense. Okay. Um, and the last point, the, the fifth point, was rolling back the national security state. 
And in the piece, I talked about uh, Chalmers Johnson, who the late Chalmers Johnson, who wrote uh, an incredible trilogy uh, about uh, the American empire, uh, including the sorrows of empire, blowback. Uh, now, Chalmers Johnson was a former CIA guy. We're not talking about, you know, a pie-eyed radical here. He was a CIA analyst, uh, you know, an Asia specialist. And, um, <clears throat> you know, Johnson said something very important. He said, the problem with having an empire in the world and 800 bases around the world and all this military spending is that it erodes democracy back home. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. you know, this, is the, this is the lesson of ancient Rome. You can't have empire outside of the country and expect to preserve your democracy inside the country. That's the most unstable uh, balance that world history has shown us and usually tends towards you know, the empire side. Okay. So what happens is you have this you have this huge military spending that winds up concentrating um, resources and power in Washington and then within Washington in the executive, and so then you wind up having an imperial presidency. You know where you can have a president sitting there with his Tuesday kill list, deciding who's going to live, who's going to die. Um, you know the Constitution says that it's the Congress's prerogative to declare war, but that's. Mm -hmm. That's gone by the board since World War II. Right. And so you now have the situation where, you know, uh, the NSA, we know all about the NSA spying situation. Uh, you know, the, the CIA was spying on the Senate, for God's sake. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's, it's an out of control situation right. where democracy can't even breathe. Okay. Um, you know, when you have a national security state in place. All right. So let me jump in there. And 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 only because uh, uh, this is a conversation that we probably should have over about an hour focusing on this yeah. and each <laughs> each of them. But I, I want to just kind of cut through the weeds of any type of rebuttal and just get to the core of a rebuttal to this. Um, the core rebuttal to this would be um, the existence in this this anarchical society, this global society, where if we weren't involved on the international stage, um, history has proven and shown time and time again, the empire is the essentially the world order. Right. Even if we even in the post World War Two order where we had a bipolar order, you know, Russia, the USSR, USSR and the United States. Mm -hmm. It's still lent towards empire. It was a hegemonic empire of the West and the East. But now we're back to just a single superpower. History has always lent itself to empires. Now, if history has always lent itself to empires and, and America withdraws from being that empire, what would you say to people who say, well, that's just going to leave a big opening gaping hole for another empire to rise? Well, it's, uh, it's a good argument. Well, here's what I'd say. Um, you know, I think sometimes the argument is, is simplified down into engage or don't engage, um, be involved in the world or retreat from the world, put mm -hmm. up walls like, you know, in the 1920s. <clears throat> I don't think that's the point of it at all. Um, I think, you know, Roosevelt was on to something when he, when he talked about a liberal internationalism that created alliances around the world and was engaged around the world. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem with American empire uh, as constituted is that, you know, as Tulsi Gabbard said, you know, after she got back from a trip to Syria, it's totally counterproductive. It winds up creating the same problems that then seeks to, uh, you know, extinguish. So in the 80s, uh, you know, Osama bin Laden was the United mm -hmm. States' big friend when, you know, uh, Afghanistan and the Mujahideen were fighting the Soviet right, Union. Right. Then Osama bin Laden turns into Al-Qaeda. So then, you know, we, we stomp into Iraq uh, and spend, is it a trillion dollars? Well, I don't even know. There, uh, leaving a vacuum of power where, you know, ISIS can flourish. And then, and then Libya. And then, uh, you know, attempts to destabilize in Syria. Right, the right. list goes on. Mm -hmm. So you wind up creating um, the same problems that you seek to, you know, supposedly put out, you know, to the great pleasure of arms dealers who then just happen to make profits all the way to the bank. I think there's a more intelligent way to be engaged in the world. Uh, you know, I don't think we have to be locked into a historical determinism where it's always going to be a hegemonic empire. You know, I'd like to think that humanity can, can do something else, can do something different. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's going to have to because, you know, we're in a nuclear age now. You know, uh, well, you, so, so you hey, actually hey. you actually led right into yeah. my second uh, my, my, <laughs> okay, my second rebuttal that you're going to hear from anyone have, listening to this conversation. The second argument is, is going to be essentially the world order as it's, as it's constituted now. 
is is really too big to fail, right? We're we're dealing with a world order that's sustained by nuclear power, and we're at the point where now we could just destroy the world order. Um, and and America would have to voluntarily wind down all these things. There's really no rewriting the world order today except this volunteerism from America to stand down its empire. Uh, so, I mean, how, how do you expect to actually accomplish this um, when really the option of breaking the, this current world order is not really tenable? I mean, we're, we're, we're not really going to see a, this change unless it's just from American political will. And, and then not only that, but then will America, will Americans <laughs> actually mm -hmm. agree to a withdrawal on the international stage such that we no longer constitute an empire? You know, Johnson talks in his book about, um, he gives the example of Great Britain. You know, Great Britain had once the world's largest empire. Mm -hmm. uh, the sun never set. The never, sun never set on the British Empire. You know, there was always, you know, it was a world empire. There was always shining sun shining somewhere in the British Empire. You know, he contends that they walked their empire back after World War II. You know, they um, in, India won its independence. Uh, their series of colonies uh, in Africa and Asia won their independence. They were often very brutal uh, in their attempts to oppress them. Uh, but Great Britain, to a certain extent. <laughs> You know, they still deal in a lot of arms, you know, they're right. still, you know, whatever. Yeah. Great Britain dialed back its empire, you know. Um, it's an example. Yeah, but Great Britain now, dialed it back. I mean, the, a huge portion of why they dialed it back is the 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 cost of the war, um, the financial cost, the the human cost, sure. the the logistical cost. They they couldn't sustain uh, after everything that happened in World War One plus and World War Two particularly. They couldn't sustain their empire. So you know that that's the type of regime change. That's the type of world order changing phenomenon that would make a nation say, OK, we can't sustain this anymore. And and I just, you know, me personally, I I don't know if we have the political wherewithal to just voluntarily do that. Um, but let me let me throw this last one at you, this this last rebuttal yeah. in the absence of American empire. Um, we we have to make the assumption that no other empire would rise for us to to as as international progressives to actually have a foreign policy that can sustain that can can survive right for us to have a policy that w draw, draws down Americans empire really suggests that we have to have an international community that's ready to have no global empire because as soon as another empire raises its head and we can call it a hedge, uh, global hegemony, or you can know all the soft terms for it. But basically, we're talking about empires. As soon as China raises its head to become that global influence, uh, America's one, we're never going to let that happen unchallenged. But then two, we're going to right. feel threatened, and then we're going to start reasserting some of the same things that we've done historically to expand this empire. So in this global order that we currently have and this propensity towards empire, how can a progressive foreign policy actually survive the rise of another empire, the decline of America, you know, voluntarily? Let's say we voluntarily dwindle down, but the gut reaction of every nation state is to be threatened by a rising empire. And then we go right back into the, some, some of the same policies that we are trying to fight back now. How do we how do we beat that vicious cycle in the uh, with the right. onset of a new empire? Here, here's the point I would make. I think we have to really resist seeing everything as a black or white situation. The United States withdraws its empire and another empire comes in. <clears throat> I think the world situation is a lot more global uh, and, and interlaced uh, than that. Um, you know, we have, um, you know, on one hand, it, just as an example, uh, you know, in the years when the Bush administration was putting all its emphasis on the Middle East, all of a sudden, South America started integrating, and they created all these institutions amongst the countries of South America. And all of a sudden, they started becoming an integrated regional area mm -hmm. uh, that people would not have predicted, you know, ten or fifteen years earlier when they were just getting, you know, trying to get out of all of these uh, terrible dictatorships of the '60s and '70s. You know. It's not an all or nothing thing. The mm -hmm. United States spends so much more on the military than, than China, than Russia, yeah. than the top 11 nations combined. combined. We have 800 bases around the world. It's not like we're going to fold it all up and go home. 
It's, it's a question of realizing that empire is counterproductive because it creates blowback around the world and it actually creates more radicalism, more fundamentalism, and it makes the world less safe. Yeah. And also empire erodes democracy at home. So it's untenable. It's not going to last anyway. So rather than just let it w collapse uh, without any kind of other way to see the world, we should start looking at a much more interdependent regional world where we're working towards uh, a situation where we can have sustainable economies and a sustainable ecology because we're also heading towards an ecological crisis. You know, mm -hmm. we're not just going to be able to just keep building arms yeah. and keep the empire around the world. The oil is just not going to keep flowing for 800 bases right. in the next 50 to 100 years. It's not going to happen. Yeah. So we better start planning now for a progressive vision of this. Because one way or another, the days are numbered on, on the American empire as it currently exists. Kurt, I, I like your article. I actually really appreciate the article, and I appreciate you coming on to discuss it. Um, and, 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 and trust me, I hear you loudly and clearly. Like, this is something that, this is the reason I wanted you to have, have you back on for this portion specifically, because you actually answered all my questions with your very first response. Um, it, it's not an all or none proposition. And we can't allow it to be an all or none proposition because if we allow right. it to be an all or none proposition, then we do nothing. When in fact, we have so much waste and so many things that are unnecessary that cause blowback that if we start the progress, start the process of removing some of these bases and decreasing our expenditures on, on the military, um, then we would already have made steps towards a progressive foreign policy. Um, so I, I heard you. I just wanted to be uh, the devil's advocate, not not for the sake of being the devil's advocate, but quite frankly, these are the these are the arguments that we're going to have to fight back against to actually make any headway on these issues. So well, I want to thank you for coming back on to discuss it. Really appreciate it. Thank you. My pleasure. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, go over to uh, progressivearmy.com and check out that article. It's a great read, and I think you should uh, participate in that conversation. Leave your comment there uh, for Kurt to read and uh, so that we can discuss it even more.